oil is 100% fat, right? And most of us are not looking to add fat to our diet. So if you are looking to add fat, there are fantastic ways to do that where you can get all the good fat you need, but it also comes packaged how nature designed. It comes packaged with fiber and it comes packaged with minerals and vitamins that your body uses differently. So um, I say the same reason we don't use oil is the exact same reason you don't pour bacon grease or oil down your pipes, right? Your kitchen sink, because we all know it clogs your pipes. The exact same thing is happening in your body when you're eating oil. It clogs our pipe. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, we're going to dish you a forkful as we get to know the author of For Fork's Sake, a quick guide to healing yourself and the planet through a plant-based diet with the author, Rachel Brown. Rachel earned her plant-based nutrition certification in food and sustainability certification from the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and E. Cornell. After being diagnosed with high cholesterol in her late 20s, she discovered the China study and started exploring the science of nutrition. After she ate a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet for just 17 days, her cholesterol dropped a full 50 points. That's when she said goodbye to what we can call the SAD diet or the standard American diet for this whole food, plant-based, no oil diet. As a licensed practitioner of massage and the pain neutralization technique, Rachel is also a certified yoga and Pilates instructor and a spiritual director who has also served as an adjunct professor in nutrition and wellness. She belongs to the University of Washington Alumni Association, Eat for the Earth, and Plant Strong Communities. Rachel is happily married and has two grown children. She lives in California, where she can usually be found trail running, rock climbing, cycling, and bike packing with her husband. Now, before we dig our forks in, remember that this podcast is here as a resource to educate and sometimes even entertain. It is not intended to treat, diagnose, or cure any ailments. There is no patient-provider relationship established between me, your host, nor our guests including Rachel Brown. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Karina. Well, I am just so glad to have yet another person who's in my local community that I can connect with on topics that we both are passionate about. I wanted to start with your backstory. Um, Tell us really what inspired you to give this, what do you call it, (laughs) WFPBNO diet a shot in the first place. Yes. Yeah, I, I kind of work with that acronym because it doesn't roll off the tongue, you know, wafapabano. So I, I change it to happy. You go from sad, the standard American diet, to happy, healthy, and plant powered, yay, instead. Works a little easier. Um, yeah, you know, I grew up feeling healthy, um, being an athlete and um, always active. And it wasn't until my um, mid 20s that I got some blood work done and my doctor told me I had had high cholesterol, which was really kind of a shock because um, I thought it was a really healthy individual. I, you know, grew up eating fruits and vegetables with every meal. We didn't eat a lot of meat. Um, We ate cheese and dairy and all that, but um, it was kind of a surprise. Uh, And when I asked my doctor what I should do about this, he said, you know, well, you can take medication. Um, And I didn't want to do that because my dad had always been on cholesterol medication and he would have these sort odd side effects, like lose his taste and then have to change medications. And I just, I watched that process and didn't want to do that. And so I would ask what else I could do. And uh, the doctor said, well, you can reduce your number of eggs and cut back on cheese and exercise some more. So I would do those things and inevitably my numbers would just creep back up. So as you do when you're in your mid twenties, I was busy with other things. I didn't really worry about it 
all that much, just continuing on in life. And then in my mid thirties, um, my nephew was five years old at the time and he was diagnosed with cancer and his Mm. mom was in nursing school at the time. And, um, they had a small hobby farm. She had taught me how to pull mozzarella cheese the summer before we had 13 chickens. Even my daughter had a small organic egg business going, um, And uh, a professor of hers actually asked her if she'd looked at the role of nutrition in cancer and suggested she read the China study and watch Forks Over Knives. And my sister-in-law called me and she read the China study and watched this documentary and they changed their diet overnight. And she was like, you have to look at this stuff. Um, So I read the China study and I always say my initial reaction after finishing that book is that I was really angry. I was so mad that nobody had ever told me this information before because I talked to doctors about what else I could do. And nobody had ever suggested that um, these kind of dietary changes could have such a large impact on my health. Um, So then we watched, my family decided to watch the um, Forks Over Knives documentary. And my kids were six and eight at the time. So they were young, but we decided to give this thing a try. And, you know, almost 14 years ago, there wasn't as much on the internet about eating plant based. You know, some people had heard about what a vegan was, but it wasn't everyday kind of lexicon. Um, And so in doing some searching, I found Dr. McDougall online, and he had a live-in program at the time that you would go for 12 days and eat this way. Um, But I couldn't afford that. And I had two small kids at home, you know, we were working. Um, But I love Dr. McDougall and his wife, Mary, they put everything online for free. So you could look at their 4,000 different recipes, print them out and do it yourself. So that's what we did. We got our blood work done. And then for 12 days, we ate whole food, plant-based, no oil. We also eliminated coffee, which I'm not sure why we did that because that's not necessary (laughs) and and made it even that much more difficult, but we did. Well, especially Um, if you end up getting the the not enough caffeine headaches kind of creeping in, it can make everything just a little bit more uncomfortable. I I wanted to pause for a moment and just talk about this concept of plant-based versus vegan because Mm -hmm. there are some that seem to be defining plant-based based as eating mostly plants. And then there are others that are using the terminology to mean fully vegan. Where do you right. sit here? You know, is plant based a spectrum in your world? What do you think? Yeah, to me, whole food plant based is not a spectrum. I, I don't understand plant based as adding in some plants. I think that should be just normal eating, actually. Um, <laughs> but I do understand that some people think of that as just trying to add more plants. So um, when I say whole food, plant-based, no oil, I mean, we only eat plants. Um, So we don't eat any animal products of any sort. So, um, you know, it's hard because sometimes you get hardcore vegans who, um, the reason I don't label myself as a vegan is mainly because you can still eat Oreos and potato chips and French fries and be vegan. And that's not necessarily healthy. So while I love animals, that wasn't what got me into this space. Um, It was really for the health. That's why we transitioned. And then learning about the evils of factory farming certainly um, opened our eyes to what a problem this is in a large space. And and we love animals. We no longer have chickens for eggs, you know? Um, Yeah, our, our, dog just passed away this year. So um, we are big lovers of animals. And I'm, I'm shifting that way. You know, I would say I still have some leather products. So I can't call myself entirely vegan. You know, I still use some animal products in that way. Um, but I'm phasing those out. I'm not buying any new uh, animal based products. So so yeah, I use the whole the whole food plant based no oil term to mean just plants for us. All right. Well, that makes yeah. sense to me. I just wanted to clarify what you mean when you're saying using these terms, because <clears throat> I've even had prior guests on who didn't define them exactly that way. Right Now, I did interview also Dr. Joel Furman on this podcast, and that was my first real introduction to whole food, plant-based, no oil. I had thought, what's wrong with salad dressing? You know, I want to put some olive oil with some balsamic vinegar on stuff. And he just said, No, full stop. I just recommend no oils. I consider those processed foods. And because there's processed, we really should think about what else we could use in their place. And he would say, you can make a beautiful pistachio dressing with orange wedges and things like that. Throw it in the blender and it will add a lot of vibrancy and flavor to the foods that you're consuming without giving you 
excess fat. And not to say that fat is the villain here, but just that when you have it in oil format, it's really easy to increase your intake or to consider just using a little bit of it to fry something with or something to that effect. So yeah, why, yeah, I mean, why, why yes. do we turn away from oil? Can you tell us why? Because I, yeah. I think everybody needs to hear this more if they're going to understand. Yes. I 100% agree. And I mean, the biggest reason is that oil is 100% fat, right? And most of us are not looking to add fat to our diet. So if you are looking to add fat, there are fantastic ways to do that, where you can get all the good fat you need, but it also comes packaged how nature designed, it comes packaged with fiber, and it comes packaged with minerals and vitamins that your body uses differently. So um, I say the same reason we don't use oil is the exact same reason you don't pour bacon grease or oil down your pipes, right? Your kitchen sink, because we all know it clogs your pipes. The exact same thing is happening in your body when you're eating oil, it clogs our pipes. So, um, you know, when in working, doing research for my book, I talked with a chef who used to teach classes in Spain at an olive farm. And um, he said that one tablespoon of olive oil is um, 40 to 50 olives, depending on the type of olive. Mm. So, I always tell people, if you love olives, which I am somebody who loves olives, sit down and eat olives, but eat the whole olive. Don't eat the olive oil because you've just pressed everything good out of that. You've, you're just left with the fat. So, and most of us, I don't know about you, even if you love olives, you probably can't sit down and eat 40 to 50 olives in a sitting, you know, like our body doesn't want that much, right? So um, yeah, still enjoy the healthy fats, but enjoy them in the form that nature gave them to us. And we try to avoid, I mean, part of the whole foods part is avoiding processed foods. And really, I go with Dr. Greger's definition of processed, which is nothing taken away, nothing added in. So, you know, oil is a highly processed food when you think about, you know, everything you're pressing out of it, leaving you just the fat behind. And I, on my website, I mean, I get this question all the time. So if you go to my website and put your email in, I send you a downloadable printable guide for how to bake and how to cook without oil, because you're right in the beginning, it's really hard to think, well, how am I going to do a stir fry? Right. Um, how am I going to make a salad dressing? But some of these things are so easy. I mean, you don't even need replacements. You can just use water to, um, stir fry. You can use broth or tamari or soy sauce or some other sauce you enjoy. And like Dr. Furman said, you can make fantastic dressings that are just as tasty and don't have all the fat, that extra fat that your body doesn't need or won't use very well, um, by adding a little tamari, um, you know, ground sesame seeds, you can use avocado. Um, simplest dressing in the world is equal parts mustard, whatever kind you like, and pure maple syrup, and it makes a fantastic dressing. So yeah, you don't, you don't really need it is the main reason we try to avoid it. Yeah. So you said a couple of things there that I want to clarify. One of them is when you refer to Dr. Greger, I think you mean Dr. Michael Greger, who recently wrote the yeah. book, How Not to Age. I, he's presently doing a press tour on that. And I got the chance to meet him in Santa Cruz when he was doing a book signing here. It was phenomenal. Now, he also yes. is banging the same drum and saying whole foods, plant-based, you know, and he limits oil or eliminates oil as well. Now, um, when you're talking about something like a stir fry and you're mentioning something like a soy sauce, to me, if olive oil is a processed food, then so is soy sauce. So where do you sit on the soy sauce and other soy type products, including tofu or protein powders, things like that? Right, right. That's a good point. Um, so I think of um, I, I use soy products, I would say almost every day. And a lot of the questions we have around soy have been debunked, right? The concerns about the estrogen, you know, don't make sure your little boys don't have too much tofu because, you know, they're going to get too much estrogen. That's not actually how it works in our bodies. Yes, it's estrogen, but these phytoestrogens act differently in our bodies. And we now know that the estrogen in soy is actually protective for um, hormonal cancers and our health. So, um, so yes, I mean, technically, um, processing, some processing happens, right? Like, um, you know, they're going to press the beans, they're going to grind them, that kind of thing. But um, they haven't added anything. I mean, I guess in a soy sauce, you could say maybe they're adding salt. But um, 
I don't think of that as the same as a chemical process. Like we don't use protein powders. So, you know, if you're um, cooking peas, you're, you're using a chemical process to extract things from peas, then to grind them into a powder. That I think is a highly uh, processed food. And we, we don't use that. If you want some protein in your smoothie, add a handful of frozen peas. You're going to get I'm glad you brought protein. this up because I have to tell you, having recently transitioned to a vegetarian diet that is trending towards fully plant-based, I just got the question last night. Um, I met some friends for dinner and a show and um, it was at a pizzeria. So I got the vegan pizza that they had. It was smothered in garlic cloves and I probably had 30 or 40 of them to be <laughs> frank. So your earlier comment about olives, I might eat 30 or 40 olives. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> ate too much garlic last night, but it was marvelous. Um but I was asked that question, well, where are you getting your protein? This seems to be one of the yeah. first questions that people that go plant-based get from omnivores in their community. They ask, well, where are you getting your protein? And then after that, they tend to ask some other things about how do you stay full and, and things along those lines. But let's start with the protein question. How do you address that? So I put a graph on page five of my book, because that is the number one question that we still get is, but where do you get your protein? And, um, you know, I, I answer it in a variety of ways, depending on who I'm talking to, you know, you can say, I get my protein where the largest animals in the world get their protein. You know, when you think about elephants or rhinoceros or gorillas, you know, um, they eat plants, and that's what we eat. So, um, you know, I also say, if you're eating enough calories, you're getting enough protein. Like, who do you know in your life that is protein deficient? I mean, we don't know anybody who's protein deficient, right? Like, nobody's walking around with protein deficiency. Um, and so most people, in fact, if you ask them how much protein they should be having, can't tell you. We have this idea that more protein is better. That if we just eat more protein, we're going to build more muscles easier. You know, it's not like you eat protein and it becomes protein muscle in your body. That's not how it works. Um, and in fact, excess protein, especially when it comes from animal sources, leads to all kinds of issues. You know, so you have increases in blood estrogen and free radicals. Um, you have all kinds of things that are harmful to your body rather than helpful. Interestingly, when you read the China study and Dr. Campbell's work, this is not true with plant protein. You can eat a lot of plant protein. You can eat five times the amount of plant protein as animal protein and not have any of these um, effects that are poor on your health. So, um, you know, we get protein from plant sources. So legumes, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, grains have protein, greens have protein, broccoli has more protein, you know, per ounce than beef does. So um, I actually have never calculated my protein. One of my favorite things about eating this way is not needing to count macros and micros and keep track of percentages and all that. We just eat a wide variety of plant foods. And we do try to you know, make sure that we have some beans every day. So, um, you know, if I'm feeling hungry or not satiated, then maybe I know, okay, I need a few more nuts or seeds or some more beans. But um, the other thing is we eat a lot of carbohydrates. We love carbohydrates. And I encourage people to eat more carbohydrates. But we're back to the type of carbohydrates. You know, we're not talking um, simple carbohydrates like potato chips or, um, you know, white flour bread, we're talking complex carbohydrates that are healthy for you and actually give your body the energy you need to run on. So let's talk about that carbohydrate source for a moment, because with a whole foods plant-based diet, you're not necessarily running to the pasta. Do you eat a whole grain pasta? Are whole grains a part of this or are you exclusively relying on the more, let's just say, starting as raw? No, I would say we eat a lot of pasta, actually. Um, and we used to pretty much, I mean, until a few years ago, it was hard to find anything but whole wheat pasta. I mean, we, we go for the whole grain as much as possible. So these days you can find, you know, in a regular grocery store, lentil pasta, exactly. Yes, exactly. There are so many quinoa pasta. There are so many different kinds of pasta now. But um, even if you can't find other kinds of pasta, 
whole wheat pasta is a fantastic thing. So, um, you know, we prefer that over and you have to make sure that the label, the ingredients say whole wheat, not just Durham or whatever, um, because that will be a highly processed um, pasta. So semolina flour is also processed, right? Right, right, exactly. It's just the wheat germ is removed so it doesn't have that fiber contained within. So, all right. Well, I think that clears things up. As we talked about fats quite a bit already, um, you know, there are healthy fats and then there are the unhealthy, or I shouldn't even say unhealthy, just you get too much saturated fat and some problems occur. You get any trans fat and some problems occur. Processed foods tend to have trans fats in them or partially hydrogenated soybean, palm kernel, whatever oil it happens to be. Processed foods also tend to have relatively high levels of omega-6s which can be a precursor to arachidonic acid, which is a type of omega-6 that can create more inflammation in the body. So we tend to not get enough omega-3s. And this is also true of people that are on a fully plant-based vegan or vegetarian lifestyle. In fact, Dr. Joel Furman, when he came on this show, pointed to research that was conducted using the omega-3 index specifically on vegetarians and found that more than 95% of vegetarians and vegans had an omega-3 index of three and a half to four percent when the ideal is eight percent and higher, ideally between a range of eight to twelve percent. This is an indication of the actual level of omega-3s that are in your tissues that are used for all sorts of metabolic effects, including in your mitochondria, which help to create ATP energy. So like vital for energy, vital for brain health, vital for cardiovascular health. How are you ensuring that you get enough omega-3 in your diet every day? So when we first made this switch, um, you know, my cholesterol dropped 50 points. We felt fantastic. We became aware of the need for vitamin B12 because we were not getting that. Um, but then there were these other question marks, right? D3, which I was surprised because we live in California and I was shocked to find out that my husband, even though he cycles a lot, was not getting enough vitamin D. Um, and then the omega probably has to do with that. heritage, right? Like if he has any <laughs> yes. Mediterranean in him. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, mainly in the beginning, we did take an omega-3 supplement because and made sure it was not a fish oil. I, this is a big conversation with people because um, for all sorts of reasons, you don't want to be um, sadly having fish these days. Um, not to mention, we don't have a lot of fish left if we keep fishing at the rate we are. Um, but uh, so we were going straight to the source, you know, the fish get their omegas from algae. So we were going to an algae supplement. Um, more recently, the conversation I have with people is that balance of the omega six and omega three. So if you're eliminating processed foods and, you know, French fries, you know, anything that you're eating that is cooked in oils and all of that, um, your, your ratio is going to change. And there are natural foods that you can eat as well that have omega-3. So um, we don't any longer take a supplement, but we eat, we make sure we're having walnuts. We make sure we're having hemp hearts, you know, we're eating chia seeds and flax seeds. And these are things that we eat almost on a daily basis. So, um, you know, especially in the beginning for people who are still, yeah, you know, eating a lot of omega-6, then yeah, definitely to get that ratio in balance is a helpful thing. And then to make sure that you're staying on top of getting enough is is important. Yeah, well, recent research has pointed to the balance being less important and it being more important that you're getting sufficient omega-3 and sufficient omega-6. In fact, even if you reduce your omega-6s, it doesn't necessarily bring bring the omega-3 percentage up in your tissues. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very curious to see, Rachel, what your omega-3 index is today, um, at, given that it's just really, really tough, difficult to get enough EPA and DHA if you're only consuming those terrestrial omega-3 sources without also consuming algae. Yeah, I should have looked at my blood work before before I came on. Um, I, you know, mainly after working with um, Dr. Campbell, the other thing and, and the reason we don't do a lot of supplementation is after reading his book whole and having conversations with him about how supplements work in our bodies. So we're kind of back to the olive oil thing, right? Where when you extract one part of something, it doesn't work the same in our bodies, right? So um, we just in general don't 
do supplementation, we eat real foods and try and get everything we need that way. The other part of that is part of my message is that this way of eating is for everybody. And um, it's, it's not something that's more expensive. It's not something that's going to take more time. Um, You know, this, this really is for everybody. So um, making sure people know that they don't have to spend a lot of extra money or, you know, get a lot of extra supplementation um, is important, I think, in helping to spread the news that people can eat this way and live a healthy life. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. I will say, however, that that's the exact reason that Orlo Nutrition was formed to create polar lipid-based omega-3s, which is how your cells actually contain the omega-3s within your body. Mm -hmm. It improves the absorption and ensures you're getting enough. Um, We have run some tests with vegetarian influencers who eat a whole foods plant-based diet and don't really supplement. And what we've consistently found is that their results also come back at three and a half to four percent of their tissue levels. And so, and just taking a couple soft gels a day that they're able to increase that to six and a half, seven, even 8% within just a matter of months, taking just two small soft gels. It's not a hard ask. And, and we're actually putting the proof right in front of people. So what we do with this tested by you program, people can go ahead and go to orlonutrition.com. You can subscribe for the tested by you program. And with your first subscription shipment of our omega-3 DHA or prenatal DHA product, you'll receive an omega quant test, just a simple blood prick test. You've hit it with your finger, you put that on a card, you send it in, and it's completely third party. They reach out to you directly after you register online with your email address, and they send you your results. Those results are yours. And you can see where you are today. And then again, after four months of supplementation, it's been wildly successful, specifically for vegetarians and vegans too, um, as their their omega three index has tended to be right square in the middle of what we see from the standard American diet, which is a surprise to many, but happens to be very consistent. So if you want to give this a whirl to anybody listening today, you can go to orlonutrition.com and listeners of this podcast can receive an extra 10% off just by using the coupon code NWC for nutrition without compromise. All right. I'd love to transition again to talk a little bit more about shifting lifestyles to, to really move from being more of an omnivore to a plant-based diet and perhaps any tools that you might have to help people do that. If it's a a step-by-step process or something like that, that can help people to integrate more plants as they transition, if they're curious to try something like this for themselves. Sure. Yeah, I wrote the book because, you know, when we made this transition, our kids were six and eight, like I said, they'd been eating the standard American diet just as we had. And this was going to be a radical shift. So we made a lot of mistakes in our transition, you know, in um, being very black and white sometimes, um, which led to my son eating, you know, way too many hot dogs and cookies at a birthday party because we weren't allowing those foods at home anymore. So we learned a lot of things um, in, you know, 14 years of eating this way. And I would try and give the book, The China Study, to people and they would hand it back um, because it's a, it's scientific. It's a lot to read. So I wanted to come up with an easy, yeah, easy read that people could get their heads around. Uh, the audiobook's under four hours. So, um, yes, I talk about doing the great clean out in your kitchen. You know, it's really hard to eat things that you don't have. So, you know, if you know there are some offending foods that you're trying to eliminate, it's really helpful to get those out of your house. Um, and you know, honestly, working with people over the years, kids, most most people are concerned about kids, like this is going to be really hard for their children. But what I've found is kids don't have as hard of a time as adults do transitioning what they're eating. You know, they might have some favorites, but um, in doing the research, our taste buds, all of our taste buds change every two weeks. So if you can give yourself two weeks of getting off the hyper palatable foods, you know, the goldfish, the chicken nuggets, the, you know, cookies, packaged snacks, if you can just eliminate those for 10 days to two weeks, your taste buds literally change. And then you'll have the experience like, like my son did in eating a pita sandwich that had, you know, hummus and fresh vegetables in it. And he took a bite and went, 
oh, where did you get these red peppers? They're so delicious. And I was thinking like, are these new red peppers? Where did I get these red peppers? And then it dawned on me, it just, it'd been two weeks. Like his taste buds were changing. Those red peppers tasted really sweet because he wasn't eating things that were overly sweet. So, you know, with kids, really with anybody, I mean, this goes for spouses who are reluctant or, you know, you yourself, if you're having a hard time making the transition, I suggest taking some of your favorite foods and just looking for recipes that are whole food, plant-based, no oil equivalents of those foods. So, you know, we did macaroni and cheese, you know, we call it macaroni and not cheese. We made it with a cashew nut base and you can make it with oats if you would rather. So um, we have a lasagna recipe that we make for family and friends. Nobody knows it's even plant-based. You know, it has mushrooms that give it a really meaty texture, um, a tofu ricotta in it. So it's delicious. Um, But you can make burgers. I have recipes for the book in, in, in the book of those, um, you know, just whatever your favorite food is missing French fries, you can make air fries or potato wedges in the oven. Um, it's, it's helpful sometimes for people to do that. Now, I also get people who don't want to do the all or none, you know, give it a 10 day try. And some people are more slow adopters. And I talk about in the book, knowing yourself to really think about how you've transitioned to other things in your life. And, you know, it's just fine to be a slow adopter. Some people need more information or more time. And you can slowly add more things in and slowly get rid of things you want to get rid of. That works works as well. So um, either way is a good plan to get to the same place. The magic though of giving it up, giving up some foods you don't want, you know, animal foods, the dairy and meat for two weeks is that you will notice faster and you can attribute things to, to your diet that you might not notice if you're spreading it out, right? So in that two weeks, many times people will come back and say, oh my gosh, I'm sleeping better. My digestion is totally calmed down. I feel totally regular. Um, yeah, I have more energy than I've had since my mid-20s. My skin is clear. All these things that happen when you make a drastic change. Um, and that can be so helpful in helping people decide to continue on with something once they see the immediate effects. I had to put a disclaimer in the beginning of the book because if somebody is choosing to do this and they're on blood pressure medication or diabetes medication, insulin, you might have to reduce your medication as Dr. Joel Furman does with people, right? In as little as 24 to 48 hours. So that's how fast your body can start to repair. People off of something like five drugs, five prescription drugs over the time of his protocol when they come to his facility, which is incredible. It's also incredible that people are on that many drugs. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you can use your food essentially as your medicine um, and getting your health on track. And I think that's the overarching message here is that when we get our nutrition right, when we're feeding our bodies with nutrient density as one of the key components, then you see things like hunger disappear. Um, What I will say from my personal journey, I gave up dairy for the most part first because I learned that I was dairy sensitive. I thought I would never be able to give up cheese. And what I found was that when I stopped drinking milk, that my skin cleared up. I still have a little bit of Parmesan on my pasta. I really enjoy that, but it's like just the tiniest bit of condiment, right? Which is why I wouldn't call myself fully plant-based yet. Uh, Another element for me is with my skin clearing up, I also just felt like less hormonal swings, mood swings. And so this is probably related to all the hormones that are inherently in our dairy products, even though I was mostly organic. Um, Heck, when I went to get a latte at Starbucks, what are they using? It's definitely not organic, right? And so you just get more exposure to these sorts of things. You're you're having perhaps ricotta in your ravioli or something to that effect. And that's mostly just made from whole milk too. And so with an inborn sensitivity, I was breaking out and I was also having more hormonal impacts that were not positive. And so adult acne is now essentially gone for me. I'm 47 and I have the clearest skin that I've ever had. Like yeah. That was one major effect for me. Well, and you did the hard work first because cheese is actually harder. Dairy is harder to give up 
because of those hormones. I mean, if you think about as a species, we're designed to want our mother's milk and um, cows, calves are designed to want their mother's milk. That milk has, um, it, it's like being addicted to opioids. It's that strong. Um, and so it is a hard thing to give up. So good for you. And that is the number one thing. I mean, um, with acne, adult acne or teenage acne is the same. You know, when my kids were teenagers, their friends, parents started calling and saying, what skin regimen are you using because your kids don't have acne like what is it that you're doing and we weren't using anything um they just weren't eating milk they weren't eating cheese so that is a that's a huge one for sure yeah the other thing i will say is that while i've given up most dairy i'm allergic to casein not whey and so I still have whey protein in my cabinet and pretty much nobody else in my house consumes that. So I'm just like, well, I'm going to keep it around till it's gone. And then I'm just not going to rebuy it. I haven't found a plant-based protein that I like. So I will likely be heading right in your direction, Rachel, of just, you know, hey, if I want more protein in my shake, I can throw some chickpeas in there or some white beans or something to that effect. Um, you know, I will say that I tried out Dr. Michael Greger's suggestion of putting white beans in my own meal in the morning. And I didn't even notice it. I did a TikTok on this because I was like, okay, guys, I'm going to sample this thing he said to do that sounds kind of crazy. Yeah. See what I think, right? And yeah. just mashed it in there. It was right. more filling. I added more protein to my diet and it barely even changed the texture. So right. to give you that kind of a concept that you could do something and add a white bean to a dish that is semi-regular, um, healthy whole grain poly, um, it's a it's a carbohydrate, but it's like actually a complex carbohydrate, right. and then add more protein to it with beans. It was delectable. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> no Fantastic. issue. Fantastic. Exactly. Super easy. Yes. Yes. And so the I was just going to say the one. Um, I would say under Dr. Michael Greger's definition of processed food that we would eat would be, I don't know if you've heard of PB2 powder. So this is peanut butter that has had just the fat removed. So it's like 93% fat free. So it's a powder form. You can remake, you know, peanut butter just by adding a little water and it's runny. But some people, if they were looking for more protein, you could use that to scoop into your, you know, smoothie or put on top of something if you wanted. Um, that's, that's one product that we buy. And we do that because we try to not to eat as much fat because I, my son and I carry the APOE uh, three four gene, so um, our bodies store fat really efficiently. And anytime we up the nuts, we start gaining weight pretty rapidly. Um, and so that's just some some place where we're careful. But yes, like you said, adding those beans, adding a whole food that has protein in it is only going to help you out. It's going to help you be fuller because it's got all that fiber and all the other good stuff in it, um, not just the protein. So you're you're doing yourself a favor anytime you add a whole food form of protein if you're looking for it. Yeah. One thing else I'll also share is that when I travel on business, I find it harder to maintain my weight for that very reason, unless I'm counting calories or logging it in a scrapbook of some sort. And the reality is that when you are eating a whole food plant-based diet, it doesn't feel like you have to count calories. I just came back from a five-day business trip to Natural Products Expo West, sampled a lot of vegan and plant-based foods on the floor, and <laughs> I didn't gain a, a pound. I actually lost about 0.4 pounds on that trip, which is a rarity considering, you know, again, travel away from home. You're not necessarily eating what you typically would. Some of what I was eating was more processed than what I would consume mm -hmm. at home just because I wanted to try that samosa. And I wanted to see what this new novel ingredient tasted like in a food application. Um, there was a lot of really interesting innovations coming out of plant-based. So I yeah. wanted to experience some of those and to have no ill effect from that and no you know, growing waistband on the trip is actually kind of phenomenal. It really is. And, you know, I, I talk about in the book, some trip, tricks and tips for eating out, um, for traveling, that kind of thing, because it does like any new thing, it can take a little getting used to, but, um, you know, for eating out, I, I, 
it, it really for us, it's the oil because we don't usually fudge on, you know, eating plant based products. But even if you're eating vegan out, you're usually going to get some oil, or like you said, maybe some highly processed cheese or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, we found the same thing that our bodies have really adapted to this way of eating. And even if we do gain a few pounds, you know, we were in France last summer. Um, and we ate vegan the entire time, even outside of Paris. But, you know, we gained a few pounds. And, you know, within a week, those are gone just by being at home and not eating oil added to anything without counting calories or, you know, measuring what we're eating. I've just, I've never done that. And I, I won't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just so lovely to not have to do that. Um, and I see people who are measuring and just that takes so much brain energy. And, and I want this, I want people to know that this can be really easy, right? Like you don't have to be doing that measuring, counting, um, factoring on those all those things, just try and eat a well rounded, like we, we go for more um, variety, you know, try and get those 30 different kinds of plants in your week, you can make a soup and get 20 different kinds of plants in your one soup, you know, so it's really not that difficult. Once you start broadening your horizon on what is out there in uh, the whole food plant based area. Yeah. I also understand right around the time that this episode will likely come out that you are speaking at an event in the Santa Cruz, California area called Veg Fest. Hopefully this can just precede that because I believe it's going to be the first weekend in April. Can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be talking about? Yeah, you know, I'm super excited to be speaking at VegFest. Um, I think the title was um, Your Kids Can Eat Healthier, Even If It Seems Impossible, the 10-day process to make a lasting change in your kitchen and family. Um, so that's the title of my talk. And I'll, I will be really excited to be joining the stage with um, a lot of other wonderful presenters and people in this space. Um, and excited this hasn't happened since before COVID. So um, that year they had 5,000 people um, or around that. So excited for people to come out and um, yeah, be sharing some tips of how to make this the easiest thing possible for your family, for your kids, uh, for anybody that you come into contact with. So um, everything from, you know, I, I mean, I have some recipes in the book that I will share making, you know, another thing when we were talking about kids specifically, you know, I love that you can eat dessert in this way of eating. It's not like a uh, something you have to be really careful about. You know, one of the things in my book is a happy peanut butter ball. And oftentimes when I speak, I make them to share with people. So, you know, I mean, it's a nut butter and um, usually oats or um, ground oats, you know, to flour and uh, some date syrup or pure maple syrup. And then you can add all these other different things to it, right? But it makes a delicious snack. It's a great thing you can grab if you're going for a long trail run or a long bike ride. Um, so you can make these delicious things that kids will consider a dessert, but this could also be a breakfast cookie, you know, or something you take in your lunch or something you have for a snack. Um, so simple things like adding in what we would call desserts, you know, they're tasty, but they have wonderful things for you in them. Um, adding in greens to every meal, just different tips and tricks to not really sneaking, I'll say sneaking things in, but not in a way that you don't tell them it's there, but in ways that you won't even notice, like you mentioned with the white beans in your oatmeal, right? It's probably nothing you would have considered before, but um, you don't even have to know they're there and it's still delicious. So um yeah, it'll it'll be really fun to uh, get to meet lots of people who are interested about eating vegan and um, being in a vegan space. You know, you have me remembering um, another author that I featured on this show who wrote the book Brownies for Breakfast. And she <laughs> has in that book a delicious dessert that is grain free, which starts with a base of, I believe, pumpkin or squash, and then a lot of cacao powder and things like maple syrup. And I think there's a nut butter in that one too to add some creaminess, um, mm -hmm. but really is able to make something that sounds like a delectable treat, but that could be eaten any time of day that doesn't spike your blood sugar. And that is also vegetarian, vegan, and just health promoting. So, you yeah. know, there are so many creative ways to integrate more plants into our diet and to replace some of the things that are really dragging us down. And I have heard over the course of 
the last few years as I've been on this journey too, um, questions around things like being gassy or bloated, especially during a transition to being more plant-based. So before we wrap, I hope you can help me address that question, especially as people are thinking about bringing in more beans to their diet. Yeah, sure. And it is a um, pretty common complaint, especially if you haven't been eating a lot of beans. Um, you know, our, our gut microbiomes need to be able to digest these things. And if we don't have them, we need to give them time to build up. So uh, some people will say, um, you know, I can't eat cabbage because it makes me really gassy or cruciferous vegetables, the same thing. So it's not only beans. But I would suggest for people... Um, if you're having a hard time tolerating beans, maybe start with lentils instead and just add a couple tablespoons each day um, or every other day to start out with. And then work your way up, you know, work it up to a quarter cup of beans that you can, you know, once you can tolerate that. The same goes for the cruciferous vegetables. Maybe start with them steamed or cooked first and then slowly start introducing them raw and your body will adapt. Those good bugs are going to be so happy once you give them what they need. And um, you'll find yourself wanting to eat these foods because of how you feel after you eat them. But yes, in the beginning, like many things, it'll take a little bit of a transition period, possibly. Um, some people have been eating beans, you know, in the form of, you know, carne asada burrito with beans in it or whatever, they've been eating a lot of beans. And so they don't experience this issue. But for people who haven't been eating a lot, it, it can take a little bit of time. But rest assured that will go away. And um, you'll be feeling fantastic. Well, I have to say, I just thank you so much for joining me today. I think that our audience has likely learned a thing or two that they may not have already known. I will be sure, of course, to link with show notes to your book, For Fork's Sake, which is available at forforksakebook.com. And I know you're available on all these social media channels, so I'll go ahead and include links to each of those spots with show notes and our, in our expanded blog at orlonutrition.com. What closing thoughts would you like to leave our audience with? You know, I want people to know that... Um, it's not as hard as you think it might be to make this transition. And I just would encourage you to give yourself the gift of 10 days to give this a try. Make sure you get your blood work before try it for 10 days, get your blood work after and see how you're feeling. You know, you you don't feel your cholesterol dropping. You don't usually feel your blood sugar or your, um, your blood pressure as well. You know, so these things you might not notice, but when you get your blood work back, you'll be astounded at what has taken place in your body. You will notice the energy you have, the radiance other people are seeing in you, uh, your clearer skin, your sleep, all these other fringe benefits, not to mention you'll be saving money on groceries and you'll likely be saving time once you get some batch cooking techniques down. So I really urge people to give themselves the gift of 10 days and give it a try see how you feel grab a friend and do it together well perfectly said thank you again so much for joining me today thank you so much it's been a great time as promised i will be sure to include links to everywhere you can learn more about rachel brown and her book for fork's sake with show notes and in our expanded blog at orlonutrition.com if you enjoyed today's episode, I encourage you to look back at our catalog of episodes, including the episode where I interviewed Lynn Parmeter Brown about her book, which is specifically called Brownies for Breakfast, and also Dr. Joel Furman around his work in this plant-based, real whole food plant-based, no oil regimen. Um, he provides some incredible resources as well. You might also dive into episodes with Dr. William Lee, who wrote Eat to Beat Disease and Eat to Beat Your Diet. And let's keep our fingers crossed together that I can invite Dr. Michael Greger on this show to be able to talk about his important work in this space as well. I'd also encourage each of you to go ahead and subscribe, click the thumbs up, five-star rating. All of those things help us reach more people so we can do more good and help more people enjoy greater health benefit with more knowledge. Every comment, each of these things helps us to reach more people. As I close today's show, I hope that you'll join me as I raise a cup of my tea here to say my closing words. Here's to your health.
Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either-or.